am Jackie Flavin, Customer Insights Leader with Demco, and this is Open Book, our weekly conversation series with industry experts about how they're navigating COVID-19 challenges. And today I'm joined by Amy Williams. Amy is an amazing principal at Berrien Springs Sylvester Elementary in Michigan. Um, before becoming principal last year, she worked, out, uh, for, she did a lot of professional development for teachers and she was a classroom teacher herself. She's an amazing all around person. She's managing being a principal and a mom of three very young boys um, during an incredibly stressful time. And so um, I just can't, I'm so, I'm so glad that we get to share her story here today. So thank you, Amy, for joining me. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, um, so to start, maybe you could just give us um, some background on, on the school and, and what you guys have, what you guys are planning out for fall. Sure. So we, um, I'm a principal at a third through fifth grade elementary school building. Um, we have five sections of each grade level um, with about 25 students per class in a traditional year. So about 375 third through fifth grade students. Um, we are a rural district with kind of an urban feel. Um, we have a very large urban district um, that many of our students come to a school of choice from that district. So we have a very diverse population. We also have a um, university in district um, that draws a lot of international students. So we have actually 34 distinct languages spoken by our students. Um, oh, so cool. pretty, pretty neat um, district and building to be a part of. Um, we pride ourselves as a district. Um, we say that we are a district of choice because we're a district of choices. Um, so that's been something that's been part of our narrative before COVID. Um, and so it really meant a lot to us to continue living our vision and mission um, even in COVID times. So we've done a lot of planning and discussing about what our parents and families need um, and how we can best be responsive to that need. So we have three options for families for um, the elementary level. One being face-to-face, -face, which is pretty traditional, but with lots of protocols and procedures in place to keep kids and students um, and our um, staff safe. And then we have what we're calling the connected classroom. Um, and these students would be assigned a teacher from our district. So it would be a familiar face um, and they would follow similar pacing and um, using similar materials as what our students that are attending face-to-face -face would experience. And then our third option is through our virtual academy. Um, and that's something that had been established pre-COVID and for our first grade through fifth grade students, it's really more of a homeschool model. So our school provides the resources, um, but the parents um, are providing the content and instruction to students. And you're waiting till Monday, you said is the deadline, so that- Yes, yeah. so um, ideally all of our students and families will have made their choices by Monday, um, which will kind of start the ball rolling on staff reassignments and, um, giving us a little bit more of an idea of how many students, like I said, we had 125 in a traditional year. So, you know, if 30 students from a grade level opt to go online, um, that's, you know, we can evenly distribute that um, number across those four sections and pull one teacher. So it'll be interesting to yeah. see so far. Um, we have more families opting towards that connected classroom option. That, that, I'm sure that's sort of a relief in some ways. It makes the in-person learning a lot easier. You were, I mean, like like many schools, um, you were saying that the real constraint is space, right? I mean, you can you can't make the building bigger, um, especially in a short amount of time. So, um, it sounds like you guys are really just thinking all, through all of the different scenarios. And I'm so glad that you'll you'll hopefully have some clear direction on Monday. Um, it, are the responses due like Monday at noon or Monday at like five? Um, so we have had a lot of um, communication back and forth with parents and Monday is, you know, the deadline, but also we're trying to be empathetic and compassionate um, with families and recognizing that everyone kind of has their own 
piece of information they've been waiting to hear about. So one of the pieces of information that's kind of late to the party has been the health department's protocol for um, the testing and the isolation periods. Um, so that information is like kind of just now being released. So even though we're hopeful that we'll have most students' um, responses by Monday, we're also just trying to be considerate that some people are waiting for that information. So it's, it's not like a drop dead Monday, but um, we're hoping. Yeah, I was just thinking if I were at you, I'd be like, refresh, refresh, refresh on my computer, just waiting for the responses. And we are asking, actually, I, I know that a computer would be much more efficient, but we're asking families to call like um, because we really want to touch base with them and have that touch point and, and help them to understand that even if they're opting to be virtual for a semester, that they're still very much a Sylvester student and very much connected to our school family. Um, we feel like that's really important. Um, so even though it's not the most efficient way to get that information, we really didn't want to lose on that personal touch of, um, just calming families, you know, wonders and insecurities about what choices they're making. Yeah. Oh, that's a really good idea. I mean, a personal connection during this time is everything. And also other districts I know have relied on surveys and that, that can leave out people with digital inequities um, challenges. So that's really awesome. And you, you mentioned your staff. I mean, okay, first of all, what principals do and you in particular is amazing. You've got your students, the community, your staff, um, the district, not to mention your personal life. You've got three beautiful boys um, and you find time to be a CrossFit athlete too, which is like just so impressive. Um, but you've got your staff and, and you mentioned that they're, they have some varying opinions on or varying levels of comfort with everything that's going on. Um, you guys have a lot of really great tools that you're using to work through this. Can you share some of them? Sure. So um, when Jackie and I started the conversation a few minutes ago, she said, you know, how are, are your staff members feeling? And I said, you know, we really have kind of the full span. We have some people that are in your more at risk categories, um, staff members that personally have illness um, or family members have illness. And then we have people that feel like this isn't as big of a concern or that we've been there before we've navigated flu seasons, you know, and they're just anxious to, they're craving that normalcy. Um, so one of the things that we've kind of um, gone back to as a staff is using that common vocabulary that we define for students. So in our building, we use something called zones of regulation and it's a color-based system um, that helps students have and, and staff have that shared vocabulary for feelings. Um, so it's very common if you were to walk through the halls of our building to hear um, teachers doing color check-ins. Um, you know, how are you feeling? A blue would be um, for a student that was feeling kind of down, somewhat um, maybe drowsy, tired, sad. Um, yellow would be find, kind of feeling edgy, like they can feel themselves sort of getting towards that place of losing control, um, anxious. Red is, you know, really upset um, to the point of agitation, extreme frustration, but it also can be very, very excitable. And green is, you know, feeling good, ready to learn, um, feeling open and calm. Um, so we talk to kids about, we want to be in the green zone. We want to live in the green zone. We can go visit yellow, blue, or red, but we want to, you know, work our way back to green. And so as a staff, um, you kind of revert back to what you've practiced. So that's been nice um, to kind of talk through our own emotions and, um, to remove any stigma or perception of a stigma for all the different ways that staff are feeling. Um, that's, that is truly, as a leader, the thing that um, weighs the most heavy on my heart is, can we all occupy a space and be kind to one another? Um, and that's the most important for me to model. Um, as adults, I think, you know, kids are extremely perspe perceptive, especially in times um, that could be considered traumatic. I think they're really looking to the adults in their life and they're reading into our body language. And um, I think giving ourselves that shared language, um, we have what we call a PBIS team, positive behavior intervention support. 
um, we are meeting um, pretty regularly to talk through this and um, creating resources for teachers when we do welcome students back um, face to face or virtual um, to go through and review these lessons um, on the zones of regulation, give kids strategies. Um, I think oftentimes, you know, when we see kids highly agitated, our go-to strategy is to remove them from the environment. Um, but sometimes that can be very stigmatizing and it, it makes them feel like an outsider. So we want to equip staff and students with strategies to keep them part of our community um, just the way that they are. Whether they're green, yellow, blue, or red, we want them to, to be accepted and feel um, like no matter where they fall in that continual emotion that they're loved and cared for. Mm, that's so awesome. And I love that you practice what you do with your students with the staff too, like just to make it a school-wide thing. And I'm sure the students see you, the staff talking about their colors. That's so wonderful, especially yeah. when we have to point a staff to even model it. Um, we have, we start our day with announcements and we end our day with announcements. Um, last year we were able to have we call them class meetings and we would take the entire fifth grade class um, into the gymnasium and have a meeting. We're not gonna be able to do that right now, um, but we're thinking through, again, our PBIS team, how can we still have that unity piece? Um, because I think it's very powerful for students to see the leader of the school say things like, you know, hey, I was in red, um, you know, I spilled my coffee down my pants. I was running late um, because my son had to go to the bathroom as we were running out the door and, and just say to them, you know, me too. Like all of those very complicated, complex emotions that you're feeling, me too. And, you know, here's how I got back to green. Yeah, that's so great. It's so simple, but it's, it's some, for some reason not like part of normal every day for a lot of people. I'm so glad that you guys do that. Um, we have signage all over our building um, because we found that even students learning preferences, some kids are very comfortable saying, I'm in green, mm -hmm. whereas other kids really would like to point. They feel more comfortable pointing and um, the, the signage is um, pictorial so they can even point to a face. This is how my face is feeling. Oh, yeah, that's really awesome. Um, you also mentioned uh, for the staff, because there's so many things that you guys are working out that you have sort of a framework for decisions um, or like you categorize decisions a certain way, which I thought was so helpful. Could you share about that? So my staff, this is my second year um, working here as a principal. I had interacted with most of the staff here previously as the curriculum director. So not a new leader to them, but a new leader um, in a different capacity. And so it was very um, important to me for them to understand um, kind of my perspective on shared leadership. And so one thing that's really worked for us as a staff is for me to define for them, you know, is this a me decision? Is this an Amy decision? Is this a we decision? As the staff, we're going to decide something together, or is this a you decision? So you, as an individual staff member, or as a grade level team, will decide. And I think that that's really um, clarified for them. I think some of their frustration, confusion, anxiety stems from where, what is my lane? What what am I supposed to be doing? Um, especially as all of these different protocols um, for COVID come out, and I mean social media has been a huge place where you see teachers and edge bloggers sharing different resources but so many of those resources vary greatly from state to state or district to district so there's an inundation of information and i think just being really clear on you will have an opportunity to arrange the way that your desks fit in your room or not yeah. you know that'll be done for you. I think those kinds of things, clarifying for them, they just are relieved to know, okay, Amy's taking care of that, or the district's taking care of that. Okay, this, you know, I'm gonna be the one that decides how I'm going to have students distinguish between their pencils, crayons, rulers, scissors, from their table mates, pencils, crayons, rulers, and scissors. So that's been really helpful for us. Um, also, we are really clear, um, in our staff meetings. I think one of the most precious things for 
adults, humans, <laughs> but certainly teachers is time. Um, we don't have a lot of time and we want to use all of our time in ways that are high leverage that really support the learning of our students. Um, so when we do have that precious time, um, whether it be a staff development day or a staff meeting, um, we are very clear about whether or not what we're discussing is a discussion where all ideas are welcomed and it, it really is just the goal to just get all takes on something out there or if it is a dialogue that will end in a decision. Um, I have staff members who like to shortcut the um, discussions and they wanna get just to dialogue and they wanna make a decision right now. And I have staff members that would like to stay in the discussion circuit forever. So again, defining for them, you know, we're gonna have this time of discussion and then the next time we meet, we will have dialogue and make a decision. Or, you know, we're gonna have discussion twice because there's a lot that we need to work towards to get to, you know, a healthy majority or get to a consensus. Um, and I feel like, you know, people, will hear me say often, I don't have to be right, but I have to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I need to know where we're at and how we feel about things. Um, because if we don't have that healthy majority, um, we're really not going to have traction and get to where we need to go. Yeah. Gosh, you have so many different groups of people to factor into every decision you make. I love that you, you give, you give the staff some clarity um, when like there's just there's just so so many uncertainties so um, kudos to you for nipping some of the anxiety in the bud um, like that that is just so smart um, I'm wondering if you could also share I I really um, I earlier when we were talking um, I was saying oh are there any goals that you have that you're sort of putting to the side and I just really love what you had to say about how you're thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion at the school. Do, would you mind sharing a little bit about just how you think about it? So we um, have, like I said, a very diverse population, not, um, you know, your traditional, I think most schools do have an African-American subgroup, a Hispanic subgroup, a white subgroup, maybe, you know, an Asian subgroup. We have even, I mean, our African-American subgroup could be subgrouped into many countries um, with very distinct cultures. And um, we do not, unfortunately, have the same cultures of our students represented in our teaching staff and in our instructional staff. And so it, it is hard at times to truly um, relate. One of the things that I have felt so blessed and fortunate from um, our time away from each other being physically together in the building was it kind of drove us out of the building and um, you know we had a lot more personal contact one of my expectations of staff while we were off um, from March um, 13th till present um, was that they would speak with their students family once a week um, and the things that we learned and shared with one another is so different than ever had been shared, you know, in a 10 minute parent teacher conference. Um, so I think we're beginning to peel back the onion of what our families from all these diverse cultures really need to feel truly included. Um, and so it had been kind of on my heart to pursue opportunities um, to get students and families um, that are underrepresented in positions of leadership in our building. You know, we have a large black student population, but when you look at leadership roles across our building, it's not um, a true representation. So when I look at our student council, you know, we don't have as many um, black members that I would like to see. Um, and we do have a new um, group that was formed um, last year at the high school black student group. And I would love to see that leadership trickle down um, to the elementary level. I just think that that would be so powerful and to begin to help our students embrace their culture and view themselves as capable leaders and capable of sharing their 
unique history and culture with their classmates in really powerful ways, you know, not just limited to the box of a cultural awareness week or day or seminar, um, but to really just have that be part of our school, um, you know, day in and day out would be really special. So that was something that I really wanted to prioritize. And Jackie asked me, like, are you moving around any of your priorities? Um, I'm not so much moving it around, but I would say that I'm probably bearing more of the weight than I would in a traditional school year. I think at this point in the game, if it was a traditional school year, I would be kind of um, sharing that out with my inner circle of leaders um, and asking them to kind of begin to take up the torch. Um, and just because there's still so many unknowns, um, I haven't really shared that. We did um, do kind of a, a flipped book study. Um, I purchased a number of books um, that student, or that, I'm sorry, staff could elect to read um, around that concept of cultural competence and equity and um, just racism and sexism and um, to, just not just specific to race, but also culture and um, gender, it just all of it. Just, you know, getting a bigger perspective than what we ourselves, you know, bring to the table. And a couple of staff members did say that they were ready for more, even on top of all these COVID times. So it's been good to discuss with just the select few people that opted in and, um, once we're together and I think things are rolling, we'll be ready to bring on some more. Yeah, I love that. You're so awesome, Amy. Um, I'm wondering uh, if there's, if you had to, and you, you shared so many awesome things that are, I would consider bright spots of all of this pandemic mess. Um, is there anything, is there anything that really um, pops to you as like a, a silver lining in all of the pandemic? <laughs> So one thing that we started, and it kind of felt sort of hokey at first, um, because it was like, really, this is what we're focused on when all of this other stuff is happening in the surround. We formed what we called our social committee, and we talked about what is our priority? Like, what makes Sylvester Elementary, Sylvester Elementary? And what do we want to say? Even though this is all happening, we are committed to doing this for our kids. And so we did some really cool stuff. Um, you know, our kids really are very talented in many, many different ways. And so we held um, an online talent show. And so our kids, I mean, it was really fun. Um, and some of them were able to showcase talents that they wouldn't have been able to showcase if we were doing a face-to-face -face talent show. So one of our students showcased themselves drawing and their parent helped them do like a time-lapse video. So they started out in the very beginning and then it was like this whole mural and it was beautiful. And lots of kids with music talents, um, tap dancing, um, show, showmanship, like, I said we're from a rural area, you know, kids showing us how they would show a chicken, um, yeah. all sorts of different things, riding a skateboard. So yeah. um, some things that were really important to us socially that we wanted to keep in place. Um, one of the things that I do once a month with kids is we have student of the month pizza lunches and I order pizza and the kids come to my office and we sit um, and just talk and, and catch up and have a time of celebration. And we didn't want to lose that. Um, so each week, um, my secretary and I delivered frozen pizzas to kids' houses. And we asked their parents to cook the pizza for them on Fridays. And then um, myself and our PBIS teacher got on a Zoom call with them and had pizza lunch um, and just caught up and connected. And Aww. we did um, our, our um, field day. Normally we would just have a day and there'd be all these different centers. We did it over a week and we randomly would surprise kids and show up with like field day in a box and do it with them in their front yard. And so we try to take all of the things that are super important to our kids that were special um, events and activities and make those happen in COVID times. Um, and I think that our families really appreciated that even though it was different, they appreciated having something to look forward to. So yeah. that's something, you know, as we look ahead and know that there's a chance that we may go back to a, a virtual learning environment, 
that we um, still commit to that. You know, what, what can we do? And it might be really different than what we've done in the past um, to make it feel, you know, the same or normal. Yeah. Man, if I was a third, fourth, or fifth grader and my principal and a teacher um, made an effort to come to my house, I would remember that for the rest of my life and know that I was cared for. That's really awesome. We did, um, at the end of the year, we normally have a big award ceremony and there's some of those awards that are really big deal. And um, we created myself and about um, 10 of my para pros, we went and bought at the dollar store yard sale signs and we laminated certificates and zip tied them on the yard signs and delivered them one at a time to all of the students' houses that earned things like the Presidential Scholar Award, um, perfect attendance, student council members, um, outstanding academics. Um, we really wanted the kids to still feel celebrated. Mm -hmm. And so it was cool. We did an online um, award ceremony, a live event, and we had um, almost 200 parents on Facebook Live for the event. So cool. some of these things we're like, well, maybe we should do it like that forever. Yeah. Um, because normally we do it smack dab in the middle of the day where a lot of families are working and not able to yeah. attend. So some of these things that are silver linings really have helped us just reflect on our practice yeah. and um, think more about what does inclusion look like for yeah. all different types of families. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Amy, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. Um, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you.